Good day, everyone, and welcome to uh, the latest in our webinar series. Today's topic, Facebook, the IPO risks and challenges with Kayla Tausche. I'm Tyler Matheson, and I'll be your facilitator or host today. Obviously, there is no IPO in recent history that has stirred more interest, more curiosity, more obsession, both among potential investors and certainly among us in the media, than the one that will price tomorrow evening, Facebook, and begin trading on Friday morning, Facebook. Let's do a little housekeeping before we get underway, and I turn the, uh, the podium over to Kayla. Uh, at the end of her presentation, there are two ways that you can pose a question. You can raise your virtual hand, uh, and we will then call on you, and you can pose your question uh, by speaking into the microphone on your computer. We will, uh, that question will then be broadcast uh, as audio uh, to the attendees of the webinar. And the other way is for you to submit your question online uh, and uh, hit send, I guess is what you do there. Type your question and click send. We will scroll down the list of uh, submissions and uh, call them for the ones that seem the most germane or the ones that do not repeat uh, other questions that may have been posed uh, earlier in the session. So we look forward to a, 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 good, uh, a good dialogue here with one of our resident Facebook experts, Kayla Tausch. Kayla? Thank you, Tyler. I don't know if that means that either I spend a lot of time on Facebook or uh, have just been doing a lot of reporting, but both of those things are true. We thought it was important to do this webinar because so much obviously has been talked about Facebook here on CNBC and other media outlets. And the recent media impression would be that demand is high. It's likely to price above uh, the range that was previously set out for it, the 28 to $35 range that was then upsized to 34 to $38 a share, and then they actually added uh, an additional batch of shares this morning. That would tell the market that the demand is very strong, and um, even though it is said to be one of the biggest IPOs in U.S. history, it doesn't come without a few red flags, and because it's dealing with a document that's over 200 pages long, we wanted to give you a primer on some of the keys in that document uh, that everyone who is considering investing in Facebook uh, should be well aware of. Let's start with one of the first slides on mobile monetization. This was a disclosure last week in one of its later S1 filings that really shook the market. People talking about growth for Facebook and mobile was the big arena that they expected them to see explosive growth in, even as the actual social network with users was somewhat saturated. But they disclosed in their S1 last week this, uh, this risk factor saying, we do not currently directly generate any meaningful revenue from the use of Facebook mobile products, and our ability to do so successfully is unproven. We believe this increased usage of Facebook on mobile devices has contributed to the recent trend of our daily active users increasing more rapidly than the increase in the number of ads delivered. What that means is there is an increasing frequency with which Facebook users are shifting from their PC to their mobile device. I know I use Facebook on my iPhone. I know a lot of people use it on their Android as well or on other devices. And that, you know, that they're starting to, to use it more on their mobile devices than they are on the actual network, which is a problem because they don't have ads on mobile devices yet. And as, as far as the ads being effective, users aren't clicking on the ads on the website as it is. And Facebook disclosing what investors once thought was a growth prospect now becoming a real revenue risk as far as revenue growth going forward as a public company. The bottom line here, users are leaping over to mobile faster than Facebook can adjust. This is a long-term trend, and Facebook appears to be getting a slow start. Next, we move on to power at the top. Mark Zuckerberg founded, created the company in 2004, and he retains a quite a significant amount of control, though we, shouldn't, we should note that as far as being a controlled company, He's not alone. A lot of private equity uh, spin-outs and Nike, uh, News Corp, Google, a lot of these companies are controlled, so Facebook isn't alone in this. But the S1 says, Mr. Zuckerberg, who after our initial public offering will control approximately 56% of the voting power of our outstanding capital, will have the ability to control the outcome of matters submitted to our stockholders, including the election of our directors as well as the overall management and direction of the company. In the event of his death, the shares of our capital stock that he owns 
will be transferred to the persons or entities that he designates. What that means is that everything that comes down to a vote lay in the hands of Mark Zuckerberg. Any vote would be a formality. He has the final say. And as far as what happens on the board, he gets to decide what happens there as well. Almost everyone on the board currently was appointed by him, including himself. A lot of uh, talk has been devoted to whether there should be a woman on the board. Cheryl Sandberg, the COO, is not on the board, so it does lack some diversity. And a board serves an important function at a company. It can be an important check and balance for the CEO as far as compensation and overall strategy. And right now, pretty much no checks and balances exist because as a controlled company, the, the board does not have to have an audit committee or a compensation committee. And there's also no function for shareholders to nominate a potential director to the board or any sort of shareholder rights plan if shareholders decide that the company should take a different course and want to take matters into their own hands. That is impossible. And in the event that something unfortunate does happen to Mr. Zuckerberg, the company notes that could put the company in a very adverse position. So the bottom line, he controls the majority of the company, its direction, what deals they do, what the board looks like, and ultimately where the company goes in this market. The caveat here that the company says, if you don't like that structure, then you don't have to own our stock. Then there's user dissatisfaction. Right now, Facebook already has a, um, a very, very large stranglehold on the market right now. And with 901 million users, they currently have saturated 51% of the world's internet users. That's a lot of users and a lot of people to make happy and a lot of people who have very different experiences on Facebook. As a public company, Facebook will face increasing pressure to have really solid earnings growth quarter after quarter. And because the majority of its revenue comes from advertising, that might change the user experience. As far as more ads popping up, more things that they're trying to get you to click on, because they need to show that they're effective, and because that's you know, really the, the business state that they're trying to make happy here. So if you look in the S1, they do say, we anticipate that our user active user growth rate will decline over time as the size of our active user base increases because they've saturated so much of the market already. As we achieve that rate, and to the extent our active user growth rate slows, our business performance will become increasingly dependent on our ability to increase levels of user engagement in current and new markets. A decrease in user retention, growth, or engagement could render Facebook less attractive to developers and advertisers which may have a material and adverse impact on our revenue business, financials, results, et cetera. So it's sort of a catch-22 here. If people become less engaged, then advertisers and developers won't want to produce content for Facebook. But if they produce too much distracting content on Facebook, they could drive users away. And that could be a big issue for the company. I imagine that most of the people on the call right now are Facebook users, or at least have an account, so you know that those ads can be quite frustrating, and Facebook is one of the places where you haven't had um, an overwhelming experience with advertising there yet. That could change. Bottom line, if they have to do that, users could walk away. I hear all the time from investors and from analysts and people who come on CNBC to talk about Facebook that Facebook looks rich. Just this morning, Ken Langone was on Squawk Box talking about how the multiples that Facebook was attempting to trade at were pretty much untenable. And that's a, that's a complex and loaded statement. So I want to break down some of the multiples, what they mean, and what the comparables are. For those who say that Facebook is a once-in-a-lifetime investment, they think that Facebook could be the next Google, the next Apple, the next Microsoft, which have really provided exponential returns for those investors that were able to get in at an early stage and hold on for a long time. We've all heard some sort of anecdote about someone who bought Apple right before it IPO'd and has been able to retire on that stock alone. I certainly know there's a lot of that folklore floating around there. And some view Facebook as a similar type of investment. Um, but the one thing to keep in mind is Facebook is already at a later stage as it's going public. It's an eight-year-old company. It's much older than a lot of these comparables. And it already makes a lot more money 
as you're going to see. If you stack up Facebook against Google, Microsoft, and Apple when they went public, take a look at the implied market value of these four industry peers. Facebook will be valued at up to $104 billion based on the stats that are in the current S1. Google, when it went public in 2004 at five years old, was valued at $23 billion. Microsoft in 1986 was valued at $350 million. And Apple, when it went public in December 1980, at, at Steve Jobs, one of his first ten years at the company, we should say, was uh, valued at $1.78 billion. You can see how big Facebook is at IPO relative to those companies. And you can see that that is far and away one of the biggest tech IPOs ever, if not the biggest tech IPO ever. And this is the money that they're making. These are revenues uh, per year for the most recent year before the company went public. You can see that as Facebook was um, going public at a higher implied market cap, it's also making a whole lot more money. It's making $3.71 billion for the year 2011, whereas Google in 2004 at five years old was making nearly $1.5 billion. And Microsoft was making somewhere around $110 million in 1985. Now, Microsoft has returned 13,000% to investors, but it was also at a much more nascent stage. And Google was three years younger than Facebook was when it went public as well. Based on multiples, Facebook would be valued at 25 times this revenue number. So when you hear people like Ken Langone talking on Slockbox about how it's 25 times sales, 25 times revenue, and that's expensive. This is the number that they're talking about. Google, for its part, would, be, would have been valued at 15 times revenue. And Microsoft would have been valued at only about three times revenue. But that was revenue. And this is what they're actually taking home in profit and potentially distributing to shareholders. You can also see that Facebook has a lot more in profit at eight years old. but Based on that $104 billion valuation, it would be valued at more than 100 times this earnings number. Google, we should note, would have been valued at 216 times earnings. So certainly, Facebook at 100 times would seem like a very, very large multiple. But Google was nearly double that. That's because the company was a first mover, was one of the first in its categories, and it was revolutionizing search and it was only five years old at the time. Microsoft would have been valued at 6.8 times earnings, and we've mentioned that that was a much smaller company than what it is today. And as far as Facebook, where margins are concerned, margins have been decreasing. Margins, uh, gross operating margins are operating income as a percentage of overall revenue. You can see that in 2009, before the company really started making money off of advertising, its margins were 34%. They grew to 52% in 2010, and then came down slightly in 2011 to 47%. Investors are somewhat concerned because that number in the first quarter of this year has come back down towards 36% near where it was in 2009 before the company started making the lion's share of its profit in advertising as it does now. That causes a lot of concern for the growth of margins and the percentage of the business that is actually returning a profit quarter after quarter. And if we expand that number to actual revenue, which is what we're dividing uh, operating income into. You can see how the numbers have changed throughout the years. And we go back here to the first quarter of 2010. Um, this growth has really been strong. It's been breakout for the last two years. But you can see that in the first quarter of 2012, it starts coming down a little bit. It was on a steady upward trend mm -hmm. from $345 million in the first quarter all the way up to $1.1 billion at the end of 2011. It was after that quarter that they decided to go public. They filed their S1 on February 1st of this year. And people were really ecstatic about the growth because all they saw was 
the steady upward cycle from 2010 to that last quarter of 2011, one would think that that trend would be set to continue. And unfortunately, when the company reported its first quarter earnings at the end of April, that wasn't the case. That has also given investors pause to think maybe the best of the growth cycle is over for Facebook. Maybe this trend is not continuing. Can't be sure that it's not just you know and and um, you know a one-off quarter where they uh, incurred higher costs as far as their capital expenditures, their headcount, and their expansion. If you're going to buy this stock pre-IPO, you would like to be sure that this trend is set to continue. Finally, let's talk about Facebook's uphill battles. These are things that are not a choice for Facebook. They're something that the company will have to do at some point during its corporate life cycle, no matter how difficult it is. These are the biggest challenges facing Facebook and things that they will be staring down because they won't be able to avoid it going forward. The first, as we discussed, is getting ads on mobile. With an increasing number of users shifting onto mobile, mobile um, devices, they will have to find a way to shift what represents 82% of their profit over to that device. There's no way that the company will continue to make the type of money it does now if it won't be able to do that. And the company has recognized that. They have said that they will invest heavily in mobile. Mobile. The problem also is that that might ruin the user's experience on mobile because they're dealing with a smaller screen as well. We'll see how Facebook figures out how to do that. The second is entering China. That this has been one of the biggest questions that investors have brought to Facebook management during the, the week and a half roadshow, and that is, if you have already saturated 51% of the world's internet users, how do you get into China? That is where the rest of the world's internet users are. And right now, Facebook is blocked there. And as far as excluding Facebook from the potential for growth of the user base, it appears that they've pretty much expanded as much as they can. So that's why the big question is China. As far as getting more eyeballs onto the site, they need to get into China first. Mark Zuckerberg answered the question by saying simply, we are blocked in China, end of story. Sheryl Sandberg saying, the question begins with the Chinese government and our diplomatic relations there. There's nothing that Facebook can do policy-wise to get our foot in the door there before that's settled by the government. So that will be a diplomatic issue that the company will have to end up grappling with at some point. Finally, e-commerce. The only part of Facebook's revenue that's not made up of by advertising is coming from e-commerce. And right now, that's that's primarily virtual goods that are being sold on the Zynga platform. They haven't been able to monetize e-commerce in any way, shape, or form. And in a CNBC and Associated Press survey that we released the exclusive results to yesterday, the majority of respondents said that they wouldn't feel safe making a transaction on Facebook. But given the saturation of the user base and how much time they're already spending there, one of the things they have to get users to be able to do to spend more time on the site is to be able to spend money there because we all know that that's what the majority of people are on the internet to do anyway besides finding content. And there you are, Kayla Tausche. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get to questions from the uh, participants in the webinar, let me <clears throat> unbridle myself of a couple of questions, Kayla. Implicit in, in a couple of the things you said here is the idea that Facebook came to the public market, or will be coming to the public market, later, maybe, than it optimally should have. Did they miss the moment, or were they victims of the fact that, had they come to market three years ago, they would have been coming to market to a market that was just coming off its lows? Are they too late? Hindsight is always 2020, Tyler, as everyone knows. Looking at the numbers, it might seem that they should have gone a quarter earlier um, and had the one quarter where they're introducing new numbers to the market be a quarter that the blockbuster one like the fourth quarter of 2011 it was, as we can see from that. That being said, 
they couldn't have known, they couldn't have had the prescience to know that the first quarter would have flowed the way that it did, even as they were uh, plowing more money into research and development, into data storage, into uh, expanding into emerging markets and the like. But it is an eight-year-old company, and there has to be a balance between staying private so that you can invest in the company and not to grow it to a point where it's a mature company for the public markets and taking it to the market when there's no growth left for potential investors. I think that we're pretty much in the middle of that scale right now. And they, you know, the company has said as much on the road when it's talking to investors. CFO David Eversman has said, we need a game changer. Introducing that revenue in, 2000, in the full year of 2011 from Zynga, that was the first time that they had made money from Zynga in a full year period. That was a game changer, and that now represents about 18% of revenue. That's a big chunk, and that is almost brand new. And he said, if we can't get another game changer, e-commerce, uh, other types of e-commerce could be a game changer. Uh, mobile ads could be a game changer. Other types of revenue streams, I think, is, is what they're going to need to prove that they can grow in the way that the market wants it. Because the revenue growth has clearly, as that chart showed, slowed. Partly, it's the, it's the law of large numbers, I'm sure. Right. But it is also, when you see a, a decline in revenue from the fourth quarter of last year the fourth, to the first quarter of this year, that would tend to suggest that something may be a little deeper than that is going on. Um, let me ask one more question before we turn to the audience. Apart from liquefying or cashing out the stakes of a lot of the early investors, clearly that's a motivation for these folks to go public. What is the other reason Facebook is going public? What do they intend to use the capital for? They have said that they don't have any particular need or usage for the proceeds that they'll get in the IPO, which will be about half of what is actually raised because the company is so mature and it has allowed so many big investors to get a slice of it that the, a lot of those investors will be selling as part of the IPO. There are two big reasons. The first is that uh, because there was so much rampant trading on secondary markets throughout the years in Facebook, they creeped up on um, a rule where you can't have more than 500 shareholders. And once they got more than 500 shareholders, um, I believe that scale was tipped during a private placement on behalf of Goldman Sachs. They were under the impression that Goldman, as, um, as a broker selling those shares to uh, you know, however many of their private, private wealth clients, Goldman would count as one shareholder. But it actually turned out that every single one of those private clients became a shareholder, and that's when they became dangerously close to that line of the 500 shareholder mm -hmm. rule. The other thing is they weren't making money for the first four years, call it, of their existence. They had a loss, profit loss every year, and they still wanted to be able to attract the best talent in Silicon Valley because they had a vision, and they wanted to be able to compensate people well to get them to come to Facebook, and they did that with stock. And a lot of the stock options vested. And employees said, we're not going to stay here unless we actually see the, you know, see the money. See these investments see the light of day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the use of proceeds, um, part of it, uh, the large chunk of it, is going to go toward helping employees uh, field some of the tax burden from monetizing those previously restricted stock units. So let's take a big capital gains tax hit, and the company feels that, similar to Zynga, other companies have done it too, but um, by allowing users, or em employees rather, to cash out these restricted stock units in the IPO uh, in the upcoming six months, uh, they would like to help allay some of that burden of their the tax burden that yes. they have. Uh, not exactly. only does it liquefy those, th those holdings and help those individuals, it helps them with their tax situation. Shall we go to uh, some of the audience questions at this point? Why not? Do we want to begin with an audio question or a uh, or a? Uh, shall we go to an audio question? John Murray is first on our queue. John Murray, please. John Murray, are you there? That's you. Hello, John Murray. Shall we then move on to Ken Irwin? Let's open Ken Irwin's mic. All righty. Let me go to a written question then. 
A recent analysis by a consulting group suggested that Facebook payments has huge potential, even though it is currently only used for Zynga game trinkets. It makes sense that they have big potential to monetize ticket sales, daily deals, possibly e-commerce. They have a vast audience. What do you think? Robert, I think that there is a huge potential there. I think that that is where a lot of analysts see the company going because they do have a very captive audience. I think the word captive is very accurate to describe you know, it, it's, its user base that spends copious amounts of time on Facebook. And if they're leaving Facebook, they're either going to Google to search for something that they can't search for within that bar or they're going to buy something. If they could buy something within Facebook, then they could certainly capitalize on the user spending that much more time there. I also think as far as daily deals, I believe Facebook is relaunching its daily deals uh, suite it, maybe in, you know, in, in some sort of coincidental timing with the IPO. I think it's going to happen um, you know, in the next quarter or so from what I've seen. I think that they could be a viable competitor to a Groupon, to an Amazon, which powers Living Social. Um, to a lot of those other companies. And I think that the key there, though, is, is e-commerce as well. Because if you have a Facebook daily deal, it's better for Facebook if that deal is cashed in on Facebook with a certain type of vendor, rather than have the Facebook you know, offer a daily deal and then lead the user out of the Facebook platform to have to go and use it. I think that the, the um, intertwining of those two things is going to be very important. But I think that the user is going to have to feel a lot more trustworthy of their interaction with Facebook. Right now, um, privacy is of huge concern. And it's of huge concern just with things like your birthday and your email address. And when real money is concerned, when your credit card information and your identity um, is concerned as far as making a transaction, I think that uh, the user base is going to have to come around as reaching a, a level of trust with Facebook. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Siun Arabata or Anabata Baba. Can you give us some sense of Facebook's assets and cash balance? Is this, Kayla, one of those technology companies like Microsoft or Apple that has a vast cash reservoir sitting around? You know, they don't actually, and a lot of people have, have remarked that maybe they're upsizing the, the deal so that they can have a bigger war chest to go out and do deals, but that's actually not the case since they will be getting only about half of the proceeds and the bulk of that will be going to taxes because the higher they price the deal, the more their employees will pay in taxes, so the cycle repeats itself and it's going to end up paying about four and a half billion in taxes. Um, because of this IPO and uh, what it will incur with those restricted stock units. As far as the cash balance, I believe they ended uh, the first quarter with just shy of four billion in cash uh, and assets on their on their balance sheet. But the big um, the big criticism is, you know, when Apple or Microsoft went public, they made something. They, you know, Microsoft had tangible software. In, uh, in Windows, Apple had its computers, regardless of how uh, infantile those uh, computer models actually were. And people say, can we qualify the Facebook platform as a product? It really depends on where you fall in that school of thought um, and whether you view that as an asset or a liability. Craig Harris asks, can you comment more on Zynga and how much they, Zynga, affect Facebook? Also, are they, Facebook, making any money on Farmville. How dependent, basically, uh, is Facebook on revenues that come through the door via Zynga, the gaming company? They are, they are pretty dependent, uh, not, from, not from a revenue standpoint as much as a profit standpoint. You know, it's just, I, I think that they, or reverse this, not from a profit standpoint, but from a revenue standpoint. I think that, like anything, in, in its early stages, the, the payments platform on Facebook through Zynga is still in its early stages. They just started making a, a boatload of money from Zynga in the full year of 2011. So this is at a lot earlier stage than Facebook's advertising platform is. Zynga is a very important component to Facebook. And likewise, the other way around, Facebook is a very important component to Zynga, which is why you 
see Zynga stock move in tandem with any Facebook news, and that will continue to happen uh, after Facebook goes public. They do have a partnership that expires in either May of, or June of 2013, at which point they'll have to decide how they're going to work together, what the revenue share will be. And at that point, you could see a, a, you know, a make-or-break situation for either one of those companies based on the breakdown of what, what they actually get to take home at the end of the day. But right now, uh, I can't say that they make money specifically on Farmville because I haven't looked at the, at the numbers for that specific property in the first quarter. But yes, they do have a very profitable relationship with Zynga. Let me try and mush two questions together. One is from John Pamplin and the other is from Dennis Kramer. Uh, the one from Pamplin is due to irrational enthusiasm would this be a good day trading opportunity at the first few minutes of trading, or will institutional investors dump their shares at the beginning? There are a lot of questions in there. One would be, can any day traders have a real shot at getting any of the shares at the right. initial opening price? And then Dennis Kramer says, even though the stock may be priced at about 38 a share on Thursday night, maybe a little more, when it actually opens for trading, the first trade uh, is, he says, usually twice that amount, or about $80. I've seen this on many IPOs. Why doesn't anyone ever talk about this sort of action? So the question, I guess, is the stock will price on Thursday night. Let's just say, for argument's sake, they set the price at 40 a share. When it opens for trading on Friday, what's that first quote likely to be? And what's the first move likely to be? In other words, will the insiders sell? Uh, or what? Will the, will the institutions that get the big app, so it likely to be more buying or selling? That's certainly a loaded question. And, uh, and not being able to trade stocks as a journalist, you know, you're not hands-on in the market and making decisions like that right from the open. I will say um, it might be too early to answer that question based on where it prices. I know we're working with around price of $40 a share, which is what Tyler just suggested for the purposes of this question. I think if it prices at $40 a share, it really depends on what the book ends up looking like, which if you watch CNBC tomorrow, we'll have a lot more details uh, during our, our pricing special in the afternoon about, you know, as we're getting information about who is who's actually getting these shares. I would say if it ends up being, you know, heavy into hedge funds and uh, so-called fast money, then the stock could see some volatility at the open. But I think that the underwriters are being very careful here and very choreographed to put these shares in the hands of long-term value investors. They really are eyeing the three to five year holding period for money managers. And that's, that's what their story is as far as uh, what they've been discussing with some of the Fidelities and Wellington. Fidelities, Wellington, T. Rowe Price, exactly. all have been along for this ride for quite a while. And, right. and many funds actually have the private stock, right? Right. T. Rowe Price has the private stock. I don't believe that any of the other big money managers have been able to get their, their hands on them. Um, I, I think that it, it, re it really depends because if the book is a lot of these managers, then I believe that it will not have that sort of giant jump right off the open because the thesis of investing in such a company like this isn't the same as investing in a company like a LinkedIn, which you saw the IPO price double, and then you saw it nearly double at the open, and then you saw it go up 100%. I think that was sort of the first social gateway drug, so to speak. And I think that the underwriters were surprised that the demand is there. I think that there have been there's been a, a quiet accumulation and a long term accumulation of demand here, if not real shares. And that could keep the volatility down somewhat on the first day. But I would actually wait because I think that if if you have a day trading thesis, more power to you, but keep in mind several times in the S one they address the fact that they're going to take a roughly $4.5 billion tax hit, which the market is well aware of now, and they're going to be taking it in the next two quarters as a public company. So they will have to pay that out of their proceeds, out of their pocket, in the next two quarters before the end of 2012. When that happened to Zynga, it didn't matter that they had disclosed it. The market didn't give them credit for it, saw that they had spent that much money. It caused them to take a loss, and they sold out of the stock, and, and I believe it went down about 14% that day. 
So I would say that the market, um, you know, the market might not give Facebook the benefit of the doubt of having disclosed that charge. And I think that the beginning of 2013, if you still like this story, is probably the better time to get in. Ken, uh, let me just ask a question that I saw earlier and I've lost it on the screen here. A lot of Is it Facebook, the 800-pound gorilla? And I guess implicit in that, Kayla, is the idea that it may both perform very differently as it opens, number one, and number two, it could perform very differently going forward based on its scale and size. I, I think that that's right. I think that because of Facebook's age, relative age, we should say, uh, relative age and relatively mature earnings profile, um, you know, the stock is expected to be something of a steady climb. It is going to be an index-held stock. It's going to make it into the NASDAQ 100, and NASDAQ, so, you know, said so much in changing its rules for getting into the NASDAQ 100, and it wouldn't have done that for LinkedIn, for Angie's List, for Groupon, for any of the other stocks that were going public because they were, uh, you know, they were so much less seasoned, to borrow the word that the NASDAQ used for, um, you know, the shortened period of time that they'd have to trade. They're so much less seasoned, their earnings are more volatile, um, and certainly I think that those companies were more at an inflection point of needing the capital to continue with their businesses rather than needing to go public for other forces outside their control. What is the moat around Facebook? Does it have a moat by which I mean, can somebody come along and rob Facebook of its pizzazz, of its buzz, of, of its uh, cachet in the same way that Facebook came along and blew MySpace out of the water? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Actually, on um, Squawk on the Street this morning we had uh, the author of the book, The Facebook Era, and her editor had wanted her to retitle the book The MySpace Era because of when she wrote it, and she said, no, I think Facebook is the bigger thing here. I think the issue with what happened between MySpace and Facebook was Facebook wanted to be a more broad, uh, wanted to have uh, a more broader appeal than what MySpace was. MySpace, and to this day still does, uh, target mainly musicians, and it's a very popular website for hosting MP3s or getting your name out there if you're a band or um, a, another type of uh, performing artist. And Facebook said, you know what, we're going to take what MySpace did for this and we're going to apply it to everybody. And you know, it started with colleges. It, it didn't really limit itself for very long, then moved to high school, and then opened itself up to not only everybody in the U.S., but everywhere globally. And I would see it difficult for anyone to come in and say, we're going to try and beat Facebook at its own game, because its own game is so broad. And the only way that anyone could go up against Facebook is by targeting a different type of niche audience, like a LinkedIn has done, mm -hmm. like a, um, you know, there are a bunch of other networks. So, so, that, so they, what I'm hearing you say here is that it's going to be very hard for somebody else to, to, to play Facebook and beat it at its own game, just as it's been very hard for other search companies to play Google at its own game and beat it, right? Right. When the whole uh, predication of the creation of Google and the creation with Facebook of Facebook was to look at something that was already out there and do it better. It's difficult when that's the mindset of creating that company for then someone else to come in and say, I'm going to take what they did and do it better than they did, when both companies took such a broad mandate to how they were going to fix the problem that they saw. Uh, Google search wanted to make it as effective as possible. Facebook wanted to connect everyone in the world. How do you get bigger than that? Okay, let me ask you a couple of questions about you and Facebook. You started using it when you were in school, right? I did. How did you use it then, 
how did you use, do you use it today? In other words, what do you do on Facebook today? And has your how has your own personal use of Facebook evolved, either in terms of what you do with it, or more importantly, maybe how much time you spend on it? I'll card that on the table here. Um, I joined Facebook in the summer of 2004. The company was about five months old at the time. How did you learn about it? I learned about it because um, I was entering college at the time, and I had a few friends going to Harvard, and they said there's this new thing at Harvard called the Facebook.com, and everyone's joining it, and you know they've just opened it up to what they called the public IVs at the time, UNC, UVA, University of Michigan, and a couple other schools, at UMass, Amherst, and, and some others. And they had just opened it up from the Ivy League to the public Ivies, and so some of my friends who were at the Ivy League said, oh, now we can be friends because you're going to UNC. So I used it as a way to meet people who were in my dorm, who were in my classes, to be formed study groups, um, because at the time you could list what classes you were in. And it started without even a way to put a, you had one profile picture, but you couldn't look at even all of your profile pictures. And so then the, then Facebook realized that, hey, people are changing their profile pictures a lot. Um, they want to put different pictures of themselves up here. And, you know, the human race is innate, innately voyeuristic, and they have an interest in looking at other people's pictures, so why don't we broaden out into pictures? And uh, then people started putting pictures on there, and, and it just sort of... Uh, took on a life of its own from there. And it's been a great way to stay in touch with people, for sure. Uh, at CNBC, I have a professional page where I post links to the stories that I'm covering. I ask for comments on things that we do on air and on the web. Um, but I also use it personally, and I use it to keep in touch with my family. Uh, I had a cousin who was graduating from college last weekend, and everyone was there except for me. And so I got to see all the pictures almost in real time from what I was missing. A lot of friends getting married, having babies. And so it's a scrapbook of sorts for the things that you can't be there for. Now, I don't know whether I would... Do you use it as much as you used to? Do you spend as much time on it as you used to? I do, but for different reasons. I think I used to use it... Um, I think I used to use it more for pleasure, and now it's more of a utility. And uh, I'm, I truly believe that it's a viable use of social communication. I used to uh, think about giving it up for Lent uh, in the spring because it was such a, a, a force of distraction that I would get so much more done if I didn't have access to Facebook. Now, you can't afford to give it up for 40 days because you miss important messages, important things that are coming across there. And uh, I just don't know that I would ever click on an ad or that I would ever buy something on Facebook. I think that that, you know, photos were a big thing for the network. And I think that making a purchase on Facebook would take an equally big acceptance from the user. Mm -hmm. A big leap. Let's talk a, a little bit before we uh, get back to some of the other questions here and then wrap up. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that matter of evaluation. You mentioned that Ken Langone today looking at the sort of 100 plus PE multiple or 25 times earnings. The market's multiple overall is what? About 14 mm -hmm. right now. Most companies that are sold at a multiple of revenues, it can be four times revenues, eight times revenues. That's a rich number, eight, nine times revenues. Right. This one is a 25 times revenues. Is that sustainable given the growth rate, or is that the kind of risk that scares a lot of investors? I think it's a risk that scares a lot of investors. I think that the IPO it has garnered a lot of fanfare because it's such a household name, because a billion people nearly use it. Um, but I think that as far as investing, it's not necessarily for the faint of heart. A hundred times earnings is a huge valuation. Granted, it's about half the multiple uh, of Google, but at the time, Google had this uncharted territory that it was just embarking upon, and you know it hadn't really proved what it could do there yet. That being said, if you had known at the time that Google was going to, um, you know, buy Picasa, launch Gmail, um, 
do you know by Blogspot do a lot of the things that it ended up doing and sort of owning the web? You might have a different view of it. And at the time, the same criticism was thrown at Google: was that do you do you deserve a 200 times earnings multiple? The same is happening with Facebook. And I would say that um, you know, as far as whether it's worth it. You just have you have to have your own thesis about what you think Facebook will do. Will they make a Facebook phone, as mm -hmm. people are speculating right now? Will they have an email service, which they're trying to launch, but it's unclear whether it will gain traction? They're late to they're, that party. They're, they're trying to do the same thing that Google did, mm -hmm. and Google, of course, for those investors, was worth it. Mm -hmm. Larry Cervantes asks, will Facebook only trade on the NASDAQ? That's where it lists, right? Yes. It will only trade on the NASDAQ. There are some companies like uh, Walgreens, I believe, that are dual listed, meaning they trade both on the NYSE and on the NASDAQ. But that's actually a program that only exists for companies that already trade on the NYSE, and NASDAQ is trying to win the business. NASDAQ is actually a cheaper exchange to trade on. It, it costs less to list there, and it costs less in annual trading fees. So if a company like Texas Instruments recently did, they said, why are we spending $400,000 a year extra just to list on the NYSE? We really don't need that. Let's see if we like trading on the NASDAQ, if it's different, and then eventually making the leap. Uh, Raymond Scott asks, will I be able to trade using Scott Trade at the market open at 9.30 p.m.? A.M.? A.M., excuse me, A.M., I beg your pardon. Um, not at 9.30. The earliest that uh, the company will be able to actually start trading on the NASDAQ, I'm told, is 10.40 a.m. on Friday. It really depends on um, what Scott Trade's policy is. I would, if you have an account with them, I would call um, a representative of Scott Trade and see uh, whether they believe that uh, that will be ready to start trading immediately. I know that E-Trade is one of the underwriters, so that platform should be um, a little bit more user friendly as far as being ready to trade those Facebook shares because it will have some pre-IPO shares ready to allocate already. Let's talk a little bit here. I saw a question about GM pulling its ads and I, I may have just gone by it. There it is. Uh, uh, I'm not sure who the questioner is. But, but yesterday General Motors said it, it was not going to advertise anymore on Facebook because it was not getting the kind of response it felt it needs. Uh, other automobile companies even today have said, no, we're staying with it. What are you hearing about Facebook? You just said you don't click on the ads. What are you hearing anecdotally or from your sources about, um, about the effectiveness of the ads on Facebook? Well, a big debate has also sprung up about whether GM just doesn't know how to use Facebook effectively. Mm. The company had um, had been spending $40 million on Facebook. $10 million was going toward uh, banner advertising, which you see on the side and on the top of the site, and the other $30 million was going to sponsored content. So if you click on GM's fan page and see ads for their cars or different promotions or links to events that are going on at certain dealerships, for example. Um, that's what they were actually spending three quarters of that of that advertising uh, spend on. And they're actually keeping that intact. So they're taking the $10 million away from the banner ads and they're not doing that because they found those to be ineffective. And that's what you know, people don't click on, for sure. That's what people don't click on. The question is whether the fan pages, that sponsored content, uh, how effective that can be. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg was saying on the roadshow that only 13% of all advertising on Facebook right now is in that sponsored content, which is hosted mm -hmm. on timeline uh, by, these, uh, by these companies. But I know that, that I look at fan pages for TV shows that I watch to watch promos for upcoming episodes like Power Lunch. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or, you know, for instance, if I'm going to the North Carolina State Fair and they have a, an event page, I'll look to see what time the concert starts. You know, people use, people use those fan pages for vital information, and if you end up spending more time on it and, you know, Trafficking you around there. North Carolina State Fair. What we learn about Pride Stickers, Pride Stickers bars, and and Facebook. Let's do uh, one more question, maybe here. Uh, I see one uh, from Lorenzo Maldonado 
at what level of money does one need to invest in the initial uh, public offering? I'm not a high roller or an investor. I've put in a bid for 200 shares through Fidelity. Talk me through that, Kayla. I mean, my sense with, with most of these offerings, and, and certainly this one, is that a brokerage's best customers, biggest institutional customers, are the ones who are going to get the stock on allocation at the opening price. If this person is putting in an open order for 200 shares of Facebook and does not get it at the initial allocation, the $40 a share, mm -hmm. might uh, Lorenzo then be opening himself to buying that stock at a price that he really regrets? Not 40 but 120 So that's what happens when you, you know, you put in for an unspecified offer with your broker. If you say, I want 200 shares at any price, well, your broker might not be able to get those shares until they're at 55. And at that point, if you are signed and sealed on that order, you get 200 shares at $55 and you're on the hook for whatever that costs you plus fees. Um, I think that the only way really to get around that, well, the first thing is make sure you check with your broker and make sure you understand all the rules around that because the allocations to each of the fidelities and what arms of, um, of the, the asset manager they actually go to is different with every single firm that's going to end up getting shares here. Uh, I will go back to E-Trade and say uh, we ran a story on CNBC.com. It was authored by a reporter here named Kate Kelly. And if you want to go to CNBC.com and search for that, she explores uh, the idea of E-Trade and getting shares through E-Trade uh, in this IPO. E-Trade has said that it will try and allocate at least one share to everyone who wants one. Um, but of course, that is an attempt, not you know, a, a real um, tried and true method of allocating shares here because it's still unclear how many are going to go to the E-Trades of the world when all is said and done. Um, remember, there's going to be about 10 to 20 percent of this deal allocated to so-called retail or individual investors, but that also includes each of the underwriting bank's high net worth clients. What do your sources tell you? We talked about price. We talked a little bit, and I haven't picked up on it, on the question of corporate governance. Mr. Zuckerberg is going to own 60% or thereabouts of the company after the offering price. The board is handpicked by him. There is no compensation committee. I can't imagine that anyone who is an expert in corporate governance would say this is the right way to do it. As an investor, how worried, or, or let, me, let me phrase it differently, the sources you speak to, how worried are they about that matter of corporate governance, or are they? they? They're not worried at the moment. I think the first matter of business is to get Facebook public and then take matters quarter to quarter, because something is always right until it's wrong. And Mark Zuckerberg has created an incredible company, a force of nature from the ground up, and right now, investors feel very confident in his ability to lead. Shareholders feel very confident in his ability to lead because he only acquired that 60% controlling vote by other shareholders signing over their vo votes to him. Jim Breyer of Excel Partners, one of Facebook's earliest investors, uh, you know, it, it, he gave his votes over to Mark Zuckerberg and traded them for a check for $100. Yuri Milner of DST did the same thing. So Mark was able to accumulate this vote um, you know, by the faith of other investors. I think that tide will turn if some of the big investors take a stand against Mark, if that tide changes. And throughout this IPO process, there was one point where uh, CalSTRS, one of the California pension plans, uh, came out and said, we do believe that there should be more diversity at the board level. We believe there should be a woman on the board. Mm -hmm. And that's something that Facebook could consider going forward. You know, they do have a very able executive in Sheryl Sandberg. There are a lot of other phenomenal women out in Silicon Valley. That would be an easy thing for them to do if they did get um, some, vo uh, some vocal outcry from shareholders. That just really hasn't happened. And actually, the opposite of has happened, which is shareholders have really gotten behind Mark. Despite the hoodie. Despite the hoodie, they like that. They say he's not, he's not going back on his roots. He's staying true to where he came from and his his ethos for the company. 
Kayla, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you all for attending this uh, latest in our series of webinars. Uh, if you are interested in a copy of what has just transpired, we will email a link uh, to all attendees, or you can secure it on, yes, I'm not kidding, facebook.cnbc.com, our own Facebook page for CNBC. Once again, we'll send an email link, uh, a link via email to all attendees if you'd like to replay this, uh, or you can find it on facebook.cnbc.com. Please do stay with us uh, on tomorrow when we will have uh, intense coverage of the Facebook pricing leading up to that pricing which takes place after the closing bell tomorrow, Thursday. And then again all day on Friday, the big day that Facebook makes its market debut at NASDAQ. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon.